Hi, this is Alan Chartok. Delighted to be in conversation today with Daniel Ellsberg, activist, lecturer, author, and former U.S. military analyst and strategist, perhaps best known for releasing the Pentagon Papers in 1971, a top-secret Pentagon study of U.S. decision-making in relation to the Vietnam War. And he did that to the New York Times and other newspapers. Ellsberg was charged under the Espionage Act of 1917, along with other charges of theft and conspiracy carrying a total maximum sentence of 115 years. Due to governmental misconduct and illegal evidence gathering, Judge Byrne dismissed all charges against Ellsberg on May 11, 1973. Ellsberg is the author of three books, Papers on the War, 1971, Secrets, a Memoir of Vietnam, and the Pentagon Papers, 2002, and Risk, Ambiguity, and Decision, 2001. He was awarded the 2006 Wright Livelihood Award, known as the Alternative Nobel Prize in Stockholm, Sweden, for putting peace and truth first at considerable personal risk and dedicating his life to inspiring others to follow his example. Daniel Ellsberg was born in Chicago in 1930. After graduating from Harvard in 1952 with an ABA, summa cum laude, in economics, he studied for a year at King's College, Cambridge University between 1954 and 1957. Ellsberg spent three years in the U.S. Marine Corps, serving as a rifle platoon leader, operations officer, and rifle company commander. From 1957 to 59, Ellsberg was a junior fellow at the Society of Fellows, Harvard University. He earned his Ph.D. in economics at Harvard in 1962 with his thesis, Risk, Ambiguity, and Decision. His research leading up to this dissertation, in particular his work on what has become known as the Ellsberg Paradox, is widely considered a landmark in decision theory and behavioral economics. Since the end of the Vietnam War, Ellsberg has been a lecturer, writer, and activist on dangers of nuclear era, wrongful U.S. interventions, and the urgent need for patriotic whistleblowing. To that end, he's currently in residence at the Cary Institute for Global Good in Rensselaerville, completing his newest book on his participation and confessions about his role in the development of nuclear policy. We'll talk with Daniel Ellsberg about all of this. But first, welcome, Daniel Ellsberg. (laughs) I'm very glad to be here. Thank you. Well, delighted that you're in the neighborhood (laughs) and that you're at the Cary Institute. Why don't you tell us a little bit about how it is living up there? Well, it's a beautiful place. I've loved walking through the woods and the waterfalls. I'm a great fan of waterfalls and rivers. Uh, food is marvelous, and the people they've gathered together are really remarkable. Uh, when I hear the backgrounds of some of my fellow residents write in writing there, there's Dave Zacchino who seems to be in every war that's taken place in the world as a, as a combat correspondent since Beirut, and Finn Barr O'Reilly, who uh, also is a combat photographer. And all these people know are very familiar with Afghanistan and Iraq. Dave has been there 18 times. Another uh, fellow is a uh, T.J. Brennan, was a Marine sergeant in Afghanistan and is actually writing a book with Finn Barr uh, about the inside experience of uh, combat. So do you get a chance, Daniel Ellsworth, do you get a chance to sit around and eat a meal or drink a coffee with these guys and change ideas? Yes, yes. You're forbidden to socialize during the day, uh, not to interfere with everybody. You sit alone there and then they get together at meals. And unfortunately for me, in a certain sense, the meals are so good, they're feeding us. I almost have the feeling I'm being fattened up for something. I'm coming back to my wife. I don't even want to say how much weight I've put on on this. Well, you look Uh, great, by the way, and you don't look fat at all. So I want to start with, uh, look, you're a hero to so many of us. I've always had the thesis talking on this radio station that you can't have democracy or anything like it unless you have information. Mm -hmm. So you don't have information, you can't have democracy, because how can you vote? How can you think without knowing Mm -hmm. what you're talking about? So Daniel Ellsberg, you sort of started it all. Well, hardly. I was not the the first one to leak classified information by any means. I was the first one to be prosecuted for it, though. And I did, let's say, uh, wave a red flag there because what I put out was 7,000 pages of top-secret documents. That wouldn't have been possible earlier without the Xerox technology, just as, by the way, uh, Ed Snowden or Chelsea Manning could not have put out the hundreds of thousands of documents they have without digital technology, so uh, that made a difference. But, you know, what you were just saying about democracy, 
reminds there's a, a quote I used to remember very much by James Madison, the author of the First Amendment, that knowledge will forever govern ignorance, and a people that mean to be their own governors must take care to arm themselves with the power that knowledge gives. He said, popular government without popular information is but a prologue to a farce or a tragedy, or perhaps both. I can't help but ask right now whether or not you can apply that to the present presidential election. <laughs> well, we're not getting, a, we're not, I think, learning a lot of knowledge uh, when we when we hear uh, the Republican candidate. Let's put but it that way. Don't you think, Miss? I'm sorry, uh, but there is up. such a thing yeah. as as misinformation as well as information, of course, and people take that in. I think polls have shown that people who who watch. Fox News very regularly are much more ignorant of world affairs than almost anyone else, people who, who aren't subjected to the, uh, that daily ration of uh, misinformation. But in general, now I have to say, having thrown a rock at a Republican here, that the Democratic administration of Barack Obama has seen three times as many prosecutions for whistleblowing or leaking as all previous presidents put together. I was the first to be prosecuted, and really in the next 30 years or so, there were two other cases, one of which was thrown out, three altogether before Obama. Obama has brought nine, or depending how you count, ten indictments on that, more than three times as many. And it's clearly a campaign against whistleblowing or against leaking, even though he came into office promising a transparent administration and, uh, and lauding whistleblowers. But he's acted quite opposite to that. Now, I must say, uh, I don't expect his successors to improve that record, uh, either Hillary Clinton or, uh, or any Republican. So I think we've set some very bad precedents here of, using, of criminalizing whistleblowing, basically. And what is whistleblowing? It's a revelation to a large extent of wrongful doing within an organization, in the case of classification, the government. And no organization likes to have its dirty laundered, laundry uh, aired. And the government certainly doesn't. But now we're seeing uh, people put in prison for that. And I'm afraid it means we'll have less information about what the government is doing than before. And that's not good enough. It was lack of information. It was lack of whistleblowing, including from me, that got us into Vietnam. I mean, I could have put out what I knew years earlier than I did. And I wish I had. So why don't we stop right there and ask you, and I want to come back to Donald Trump later, mm -hmm. but, but why don't we stop right there and ask you, we can all read the book, have, but tell us exactly the moment you knew you had to do what you had to do. Well, when I, by chance, actually, I came into the government as a full-time employee, having been a consultant for years, on the night of the Tonkin Gulf incident, the supposed attack on our destroyers in the Tonkin Gulf. For those kids Germans. who are listening, that's the rationale that LBJ used. That's for, right. For, well, there uh, had been no attack, yeah, right. uh, which we knew within days, almost surely, uh, not for certain, but within days and before Congress was led by LBJ to vote on an undated declaration of war, a blank check for war, the Tonkin Gulf Resolution. And before they voted on that, uh, we knew pretty well that it was a hoax, basically, that they were voting support for a supposed response, that is, uh, 94, as I recall, sorties against North Vietnam, the beginning of the bombing, in supposed response to an attack on our destroyers, which hadn't taken place on August 7th, uh, August 4th, rather. Of so I knew, in, in short, at that point, on my first night in the Pentagon, I spent all night there watching the raids take place against North Vietnam. And I knew that the government was lying. Everything they were saying, uh, my boss, uh, Secretary McNamara in defense, and the president were saying an unequivocal attack on the destroyers in the open waters that actually at earlier point been within the waters of North Vietnam. And we seek no wider war. I knew within days that the Pentagon was focused uh, almost <laughs> entirely on a wider war as soon as the election was over. So at that point then, I should have reached a question of, you know, do I have a right to keep this to myself? But it didn't arise in my head. Uh, I'd had no precedent for it, and I'd promised not to tell secrets. This was certainly a secret, but it was a secret about lies. It was a secret about breaking the Constitution, really, of fraudulently manipulating Congress into using its war powers. And it didn't occur to me that that was a violation 
of my oath of office, which was to support the Constitution. I doubt if that occurred to anyone, although they all knew what was happening and that this was wrong. Just as Ed Snowden said when he was in the NSA, National Security Agency, everyone he worked with knew that what they were doing in the way of blanket surveillance of everyone, essentially, was a violation of the Fourth Amendment and of various laws against warrantless surveillance. But they had children in college, they had a job, they had retirement, and they felt they couldn't do anything about it. Ed was the exception there who said, well, something can be done about it and something should be. I didn't reach that point for years. I went to Vietnam myself when it escalated, having been, as you said, a Marine company commander. And I was there as a civilian, but I was able to observe combat up close with my training from my background. And I did that. I was all over Vietnam. And I came back understanding, like nearly everyone there, that we weren't winning, we weren't going to win, and we should end this war. But uh, what to do about that? Now to answer at last your question directly, I think it wasn't until I, uh, two things really, I became aware that a fifth president in a row, Nixon, in 69 now, was lying in the same way as his predecessors. He was concealing his secret threats that were almost sure to be carried out. And the war was going to go on and get longer and bigger, bigger in the air. Although Nixon had been elected to end the war, essentially, he said he would end the war. So I had that information, as I had had, this is 69, I had had comparable information five years earlier. But I'd been to Vietnam, meanwhile, and I knew what that war meant and how urgent it was to end it. And then I had the example of young men who were resisting the war by, in the strongest way they could, nonviolently and truthfully, by really going to prison, by refusing to cooperate with the draft, not because they thought that would end the war, they're doing that, but because it was the strongest statement they could make, that the war was wrong, that people should not participate in it, it should end. So meeting people that were on their way to prison put the question in my mind, all right, what can I do now to help shorten this war now that I'm ready to go to prison? And putting out the Pentagon Papers was not the first thing that occurred to me. It didn't seem very promising because the study, 7,000-page history of decision-making in Vietnam, ended in 68, or before Nixon came into power. So it was so obviously easy for him to say, well, I've changed all that, that's past history, you know, and that isn't relevant to me. And I had no confidence that it would, it would make much difference if I put that out. But finally, the time came when I was confronted in the press by the fact that the government was lying about actually ending a court case, a murder case, special forces murder case. You probably don't remember that. I do. Uh, maybe you do. Where uh, it was clear from the story I read in the New York, in the L.A. Times, that the president was lying. Abrams, commander in chief in Vietnam, MACV, was lying down to the warrant officer who actually put the bullet in the head of a suspected double agent, murdered him. And uh, they were cutting off the court martial there because Nixon tended to discredit the war. Nixon wasn't interested in doing that. And I said to myself, finally, okay, this is a system I've been serving for a dozen years, uh, 15 years if you put the Marines into it, that lies from top to bottom to conceal a murder. And I've got in my safe at Rand, my safe, evidence of 23 years so far of lies to conceal what amounts to unjustified homicide, hopeless, illegitimate homicide, which to me meant murder. And I'm not going to do that anymore. So I started copying the Pentagon Papers that night. Did you talk it over with anybody, or did you just do it all? Uh, no. Well, in the first instance, yes and no. One person who'd been fired for Rand, Tony Russo, for actually making reports in Vietnam about torture by our allies, the South Vietnamese allies, which the Air Force wasn't happy to have on print, and Rand wasn't, and also about the land reform in Vietnam. He'd been fired and had become relatively radical once he left Rand, hadn't been before him. And I sought him out and said, Tony, do you know where you can get a Xerox machine? And he said, well, as a matter of fact, I do. He had a, uh, his girlfriend at that time ran a little ad agency and had a Xerox machine in it, an old-fashioned one, one page at a time, no collating, and uh, very slow, actually. But we started that night. No one else, however. Uh, so, so this was an internal process of saying, okay, I've had enough, we've had enough, and I'm going to make a 
personal decision about all of this, yeah, and I'm, I'm going to do gonna, what's right. Uh, just like these people who said, I'm not going to be part of an army even as, uh, or, and not even be a conscientious objector. I'm going to say this is wrong. I will not cooperate with it. That's, they set me the example. Now, whereas the other things I'd tried inside the Democratic Party or the administration did not confront me with the possibility of prison at all, and I'd, I'd been trying that for a year and a half at that point. In fact, not only Democrats, but people in the Republican uh, candidates, for example, and of which, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, Romney was one. Remember at that time? He was knocked off as a candidate. This is Romney's father, uh, father Romney. for so-called being brainwashed. He said, I went to right. Vietnam, and they brainwashed I me. I remember that. Yeah, And uh, I remember Gene McCarthy later ran against him. I was not a fan of Romney. He said he thought that a light rinse would have been adequate. <laughs> <laughs> But actually, you know, I mean, that's unfair. Romney was right. He was, he was looking back, and he was saying they fed me a lot of lies. Well, yeah, true. And, but you can't admit that, that you believed them for a while, right? It's, all, it's already to lie, like, if I may say, Trump and some others. But to believe lies, that makes you a dupe, and people don't want that. Daniel Ellsberg, did you actually consider what prison might have meant? Well, I figured I'd, I'd be for life in prison. I, I wasn't aware of there having been any prosecutions. I thought they'd probably been kept quiet. And in fact, there hadn't been. I was the first. That's why I hadn't heard of any. And the reason for that was, by the way, that it was regarded that the Espionage Act, uh, using that, which was meant for spies, against people who tell information to the American public, was unconstitutional under the First Amendment. And that's what the administration had always figured. But Nixon took a chance that maybe uh, he could get away with this. And as I say, Barack Obama has been getting actually guilty pleas from people. Uh, it isn't as though, let's see, I think only two people have been convicted by a jury. Samuel Loring Morrison in 1985. And then um, Sterling, Jeffrey Sterling, recently was convicted by a jury and on purely on circumstantial evidence, incidentally, based on telephone calls, uh, you know, monitoring his whereabouts and his telephone calls and the fact that he was in touch with a reporter, James Risen, who broke a highly classified story of CIA malfeasance, of a, a tremendous, expensive, and dangerous bungle by the CIA. Precisely what needs to be classified, right, so, by the government to keep their embarrassments private. And it's the kind of thing the public should know about, actually, how their agencies are doing. So Risen put this out. Sterling was proven to have been in kind. He knew the story, but other people did, too. And other people were also in contact with Risen. So why was the investigation focused only on Sterling, who insists, by the way, that he was not the source of this story? And he's in prison right now. Well, it might have something to do with the fact that he's the only member of the CIA who ever sued them for discrimination before they came at him. He's uh, Afro-American and sued them, actually, for discrimination inside. In <laughs> it's kind of a funny story because he had been trained to be an undercover uh, case officer in Iran. And he'd studied Farsi, you know, Iranian language for it, and he'd studied language and everything. And at the last minute, uh, they dropped him for that and sent him off to some Siberia-type thing. And yeah, they said, you know, you'll stand out. You're, uh, you know, look at you. And he said, when did you first notice I was black? You know, he'd, he'd been trained for two years now for this. You know, before. So how many and years did he so get? So he sued them, uh, not on that occasion only, but for other things as well. So how he many got, years did what? he get? How many years did he get? Uh, several years, I think. Yeah. They made a deal for 30 months, 36 months maybe. Chelsea Manning, of course, has 35 years wow. she's facing, is serving right now. And when I say there wasn't a jury in her case, she had a court-martial with one judge, a military judge. You know, the, the old story, uh, military justice is like military music, <laughs> an oxymoron. But it wasn't a very fair trial. A whistleblower cannot get a fair trial in this country under the Espionage Act. And we have no other, uh, we have no other uh, Official Secrets Act like Britain and most countries. That's another reason why there had been no prosecutions. But the Espionage Act doesn't allow for any testimony as to motive or whether it ha uh, this did any good to the public or whether the harm was less. Because if you're trying a spy, you clearly was a spy for a foreign country, secret information, 
there's not much they can say normally about how their motives excuse them or uh, how it benefited our public and so forth. But to try a whistleblower who has given information to the public, if Snowden were tried today, came back here and were tried, he would not be able to say why he did it or whether this information was needed by the public, whether it was wrongfully withheld, whether there were crimes that he was admitting, he was exposing, which he was, an enormous criminal activity of warrantless surveillance, which is not only against the Fourth Amendment, but it's against domestic laws very clearly. And he was exposing this with documents for the first time that could really show it. Not one person has been prosecuted for that blatantly criminal activity, only the whistleblower. As was true, by the way, of another guy, John Kiriakou, CIA case officer, who gave the name of a torturer who, to somebody thinking, by the way, that this guy was retired now and was, the fact that he'd been in CIA was no longer an issue. And they got him under the uh, Agencies Act. He, he spent 30 months in prison for exposing the fact. And again, why was the CIA concerned about that? Because he had been the first person on radio and television to say that the CIA had done waterboarding and that it was torture. He was the first person to say that. So they were out to get him after that. And when he then later gave to a reporter the name of this one guy who had been a torturer, he goes to prison for it, not the torturer or any other torturer leading up to Rumsfeld or Cheney or the president who had been in charge of this. No one else uh, indicted for this. I have so many questions to ask you, Daniel Ellsberg, but I guess the first one is, how did you actually transmit your material to the newspapers? How did you do it? Well, as I say, first I was copying it, uh, taking it out of my safe. Uh, there was a, a general misimpression that I had stolen this from somebody's safe. I was the only person authorized to read this at the Rand Corporation, and I didn't want to be the only person in the country who had that. So... I took it out at night, passed the guards, and, and copied it on the Xerox machine, page by page, several copies, took a long time. And I gave copies to Senator Fulbright, carry them, you know, to Washington in a suitcase, and gave them to the chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee, Senate Foreign Relations. And he was uh, had promised that he would use them in hearings, but was discouraged from doing that by the thought that the Pentagon would cut him off from further classified information. They couldn't prosecute him. They couldn't do anything politically. But they could say, we'll now give foreign military aid uh, appropriations to armed services instead of foreign affairs, foreign relations. So that deterred him from putting it out. I also gave it to later to Senator Mathias of Maryland and to uh, Pete McCloskey in the House. And Senator McGovern had definitely promised me he would do it, but said he needed to think about it. And when he thought about it and what, what would be said about him as a presidential candidate, if he put out classified information, he backed off. So eventually I gave it to Neil Sheehan of the New York Times and uh, actually said, how did I transfer it? First, I just let him uh, read it and take notes because I didn't want a copy floating around the Times if they weren't going to use it. And I said he could have a copy when he told me they were really interested in it. And for reasons never clear to me to this day, he didn't tell me ever that they were interested in it. In fact, he told me the opposite, that they weren't interested in it. But he was personally interested to follow it and eventually maybe get to put it out. So eventually I did give him a hard copy. Now, he was a good journalist, and he hadn't waited for me to give me him this copy. He'd promised me that he wouldn't copy it uh, himself until he had this word from the Times. But instead, he got his wife to come and got money from the Times and did take it from where I had it hidden and get his own copy early on. So did he lie to you? Yes. Ah. But I take it, you know, he was, uh, well, yes, in a word, yes. Yeah, in a word, yes. <laughs> okay. And the well, I didn't mind that, and though. The watching... I thought, you know, when I learned that uh, later, when the stuff came out yeah. in the Times, I was so happy to have it out in the Times yeah. when it did come out that... I didn't hold it against him at all. I felt, look, he was doing essentially what I'd done. He felt this had to come out just as I felt. And he thought, if Ellsberg isn't going to give it to me eventually, it's going to get out anyway. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take it. So I thought his motives were the same as mine, essentially. Uh, I fortunately didn't have to lie. Nobody asked me a question. But I was breaking my promise that I wouldn't uh, give this to anybody. I was definitely breaking a promise I had made a number of times as a contractual matter, a contract. People talk about a secrecy oath. 
actually, you don't take a secrecy oath. You know, I swear to God, and so help me God, and so forth. You write a contract. You know, I will not disclose this information, which is common, you know, to organizations and to uh, whatever. Uh, but I had taken an oath, actually, and it wasn't to secrecy, and it wasn't to the president. It was to support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And we'd all broken that oath, basically, when we knew the country was being lied into Vietnam and hadn't thought about it. I don't think anyone has ever been prosecuted for taking that oath. I'm not even for breaking that oath, but it's done all the time. Well, much more recently, how many thousand people knew we were being lied into the Iraq war? Unequivocal evidence of WMDs. Now, that was such a familiar ring to me because I think that Bush actually believed that there were WMDs, sir, despite the evidence. Unequivocal? He knew the evidence was very thin. He knew there was, it was contradicted. He knew there was great controversy about it. But you don't go to war on that kind of report. So it had to be unequivocal. Just as the night of the Tonkin Gulf incident, I'm pretty sure that, I don't know, but I'm pretty sure that Johnson believed that there had been an attack. We thought there probably had been at that night, though even the first night we knew that the evidence was controversial. There were Some said yes, some said no. It turned out there had been no attack, just as there had been no WMDs. Amazingly, no WMDs. And I will give them, yes, they believed that there probably was, but when they said it was unequivocal evidence that was sufficient to base an invasion on, that was a lie, and they knew it was a lie. And all of us who kept secret about it, silent about it, knew that our boss was lying, the public was being lied to, and we kept our mouths shut. So we were part of that. Talk to me about the Supreme Court and their role in the Pentagon Papers. What made the papers very uh, notorious was that Nixon chose to try to uh, enjoin their publication. The Times had originally scheduled, I think, 10 installments of it with several pages each, like four pages of newsprint in the New York Times. Nothing like that, I think, had ever been done. But they were going to do it day after day. So after the second day, Nixon, uh, as Attorney General uh, Mitchell, requested the Times to stop publishing. And they didn't. They published then a third installment, at which point uh, they were hit with an injunction or a restraining order. And the district court made a restraining order so as to look into it further and uh, preparatory to an injunction. So then I gave it to the Washington Post, and they were enjoined after either one day or two days. I've forgotten. <laughs> then I gave it to the Boston Globe, and they were enjoined. So here we had three. Eventually, there were four injunctions, one for the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. But then they gave up because I was giving it. I was underground, in a sense, in Cambridge, actually, but eluding the FBI, staying off the phone, which paralyzed the FBI in those days. I did everything by courier and face-to-face. -face. And we, we gave it ultimately to 19 newspapers. So as the government prosecutor said, it was like herding bees. There was no way to stop it. And by the time it came to the Supreme Court, it had appeared, I think, at that point at about 15 or 16, 17. And it was clear they couldn't really stop it. But they could say that, you know, a, uh, it ought to stop. And five of the justices actually made statements ultimately that implied that they would support a criminal prosecution rather than an injunction. Now, there had never been one. And they didn't know the law. No, no lawyer had ever looked at such a case before, including Justice of the Supreme Court. That case had never been brought before. But just on the surface of it, as my own lawyer said to me, let's face it, Dan, copying 7,000 pages of top secret documents and giving them to the New York Times has a bad ring to it. Yeah. And yeah, that was in connection with his telling me, having discovered that there was no previous precedent and that by all previous precedent, I had not broken any law. But he then told me, so my chances of actually being acquitted were 50-50. <laughs> That's what I said, 50-50, and I haven't broken any law? And then he said, well, it has a bad ring to it. And uh, yeah, intuitively, you would assume that we had an official secrets act, like almost every other country, that makes it criminal to put out government information. Well, we have a First Amendment. They don't. <laughs> 
and that has kept us ever from from actually legislating a, a an official secrets act. So instead, they use this act, which was I say was designed for spying, and therefore doesn't allow a fair trial to any whistleblower. So statements by Hillary Clinton and uh, when she was Secretary of State, and then Kerry, both saying Snowden uh, should come back here and make his case in court. He could not make his case in court. He could not say why he done any more than I could. When I was asked, as the first person to face these charges, I was asked by my lawyer, okay, Dan, tell the jury, why did you copy the Pentagon Papers? Objection. He couldn't get that question through, and I couldn't get an answer through in front of the jury. Not relevant. Motive was not relevant here. That's been true of all these trials. Not one of them has had a fair trial on this. I got off because government crimes against me were exposed in the course of the trial. That had never happened. The case was dismissed before it went to the jury for governmental misconduct. That never happened before. And actually, we sent our briefs on that point to the Wounded Knee case, where the government was prosecuting people who had taken over Wounded Knee, American, uh, you know, Native Americans. And they had had government infiltrators, you know, throughout, provoking this issue and clear, you know, malfeasance there. And they were able to use our Bruce and get some of the charges dropped. But mm. right now, of course, as I say, what, what Chelsea Manning was, re- was revealing, then Bradley Manning, was widespread criminality of torture by our Iraqi allies. As I speak to you, I, I'm thinking of a, uh, an analogy that I never thought before. Tony Russo gets fired from Rand, uh, my colleague, my co-defendant, because he's exposed that we were handing people over to the Vietnamese to be tortured, and they would be tortured in front of American counterparts that were happening there. Well, they didn't want that reported. Chelsea Manning reports that we're handing people over to be tortured to by the Iraqis, which as clear-cut a crime as if we were doing the torture ourselves. And this is under Obama, who supposedly ended torture. Having torture done by the people you're paying, training, uh, uh, equipping, and everything is not different from doing your torture again, legally. So Obama could be tried in The Hague, if you can imagine such a thing, like Slobodan Milosevic and some of the others. Uh, As a matter of fact, when we went into Iraq, uh, the British chief of staff said uh, he had to have assurance from the highest legal authority there, Goldsmith, that this was legal to do without a UN Security Council directive. It was not self-defense. It was not directed by the Security Council. So it wasn't legal, clearly illegal. It was aggression, crime against the peace. But the chief of staff said, I don't want to be sitting into the next cell next to Slobodan Milosevic. No American, I'm sure, raised that question. But for some reason, the British were squeamish on this question. Have you so talked- eventually they gave him the assurance. Uh, Goldsmith mm-hmm. first gave us things, saying, well, on the one hand this, and on the other hand no. And the general said, that's not good enough here. So Goldsmith said, okay, it's legal. <laughs> that's come out more recently, you know, finally. They, they've had hearings on that over there, which we haven't had here. So we do not have the Pentagon Papers of the Iraq War. We do not have the Chilcot hearings they've had in England. And we know we were lied into, but the details, no, that'll wait for another whistleblower 20 years from now. Have you talked to Ed Snowden? Uh, yes, I've dealt with him a lot on encrypted chat logs and Skype, and and I went to uh, Moscow to see him. He got the Right Livelihood Award that I got, and he got it some years later in Sweden, and they call that the Alternative Nobel Prize because Nobel didn't provide for awards for this kind of thing even the Peace Award. So I went to Sweden as his guest at that ceremony. He couldn't come from Moscow. He uh, spoke via Skype. And then I went on to Moscow and visited him for a couple of days. What were your impressions of the guy? Oh, I admire him very much. I already, I've, uh, I already have, I've never met Chelsea Manning, nor has any one but his family and his lawyer. She now, Chelsea Manning has not been interviewed by a journalist, by anyone, since she was arrested. Then Bradley was arrested in Kuwait six years ago, and Snowden would have had the same treatment if he'd stayed here. Snowden learned from Manning's experience that if he stayed here, 
uh, he would not be able to deal with the reporters on the material he'd given them, which he knew was necessary to explain the acronyms and explain the procedures and so forth. And he's had a lot of encrypted dealings with all the reporters who've dealt with this. He couldn't do that if you were here. He'd be in a cell. And another thing that uh, Kerry and uh, Hillary both said was if he came back, he could make his case not only in court, which is wrong, but to the public, right, like Bradley Manning, Chelsea Manning, who was in isolation cell for 10 and a half months until public protest got her out. And uh, that's where Snowden would be for the rest of his life. So I asked Snowden, actually, do you think they believe what they're saying when they say this nonsense, that you could make your case in court? And he said, no, 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 they're lawyers. They know better than that. And he said, oh, I'm not so sure. Uh, lawyers are so unfamiliar with this stuff until Obama. Now there's a handful of lawyers who've had these cases that perhaps I think uh, they don't know that they're talking through their hat. Do you think Snowden thinks of himself as being in Russia, which is hardly a... Uh, no, he'd, uh, he'd rather be elsewhere. Yeah, it's hard, he was caught hardly there. a defender of human rights. No, right. Well, you know, very few countries are. No, he would much rather be in Europe, uh, but no country in Europe has dared to uh, give him what he deserves, which is political asylum, because it would make the U.S. mad. And that means Barack Obama, by the way. And so they haven't been willing to do it. Several offered him in uh, Latin America. He can't get there without going, well, if he, if he flew near Cuba, for example, or uh, you know, within anywhere near our country, they would intercept him and bring him down. When the president of Bolivia uh, was leaving Moscow, on his diplomatic plane, there was a rumor that Snowden was aboard that plane and the French refused him entry into their airspace for refueling. And he had to go down an unscheduled visit down into Vienna to get refueled, whereupon authorities came onto the plane to search the plane for Snowden. And this was the president of Bolivia. You know, total diplomatic immunity. They ignored that. So it was very clear he wasn't on the plane, fortunately. So it was clear that he can't make it in a one-way flight to uh, Latin America without a very special, you know, they get a 707 or something uh, for him, and nobody's put up the money for that. So he's stuck there. He was in transit, in the transit lounge, for a couple of weeks, actually, because Obama had taken his passport away from him, and he couldn't get out of there anyway. And finally, Russia accepted and gave him asylum because... For all the very definite shortcomings to the Putin regime, democratically, it is a regime that doesn't say yes, sir, to everything the U.S. says. Let's put it that way. Daniel, Europe is. Daniel Ellsberg, you mentioned McNamara way back in this interview. We all know that McNamara came out years later and basically admitted to having done wrong. What do you think about that? Well, there's two sides to that. On the one hand, his publisher of basic books told me that that came out. He said, we were wrong. We were wrong. He said the publisher would not publish the book if he didn't say those words. And he was very resistant. He didn't want to do it. So, okay. But on the other hand, he's the only one of that era, that official, who said anything like that under any circumstances. Nobody else has uh, found the inclination to do that. And they haven't been required by their publishers to uh, say it in their in their very lucrative memoirs. So he's the only one, essentially. And he got a lot of heat for that, for saying you, you knew better, and yet, as he did, and yet you let the war go on, you know, sort of. Well, same could be said of me, by the way, but, you know, at a much lower level. He could have, well, he could have done what I did, very simply, uh, and he wouldn't have faced prosecution. But he would have been out of the establishment, you know, putting out classified information. That wouldn't have even been the big thing. He could have testified against the war telling the truth about what he really believed about it and what the memos were that he was actually getting. And he could have laid on the table all the reports he was getting of the lack of progress and the lack of promise and so forth. And there would have been no question of prosecution, but he would have been defying his president. And not only would that have been against the ethos of the establishment altogether, he could hardly get another job. I would have to say it went against his personal identity, you know, loyalty, loyalty to the boss, loyalty to the team, the party. You could ask, what about loyalty to the Constitution? Frankly, that doesn't come into people's consciousness. How could you go wrong being loyal to the president? 
Well, that's not hard to answer when you come down to it. If you look at Vietnam, if you look at Iraq, if you look at, you know, a lot of things, you could say the president is often wrong, and he's even doing wrong. And why is loyalty to that your highest imperative? Sure. But people act as if it is. I want to go back to something I mentioned earlier, Daniel Ellsberg, and that is the prospect of a Hillary Trump election as we speak. Yeah, that's uh, what right we're looking now. at, yeah. Yeah. So do you have reservations on either side or both sides? Mm, very much so. First of all, no comparison of all between Hillary and any of the Republican candidates. So I would have no hesitation at all to say, you know, people in swing states, whatever their reservations about Hillary Clinton, it's all kinds of reservations, some very well founded, some not. But whatever the reservations that, let's say, a liberal, if I may, are any of your listeners liberals? I think we have a few. <laughs> okay. Well, my people here at 85, I think I can afford to say that without uh, disadvantaging my career. And anybody who, uh, or, or left, radical, who says, I can't vote for Hillary because she voted for the war, for Iraq war, uh, Libya, she pressed, and so forth. These are strong disadvantages, which I see. And that's the other part of my answer to your question. Yes, I do think Hillary Clinton will be hawkish and more hawkish than Barack Obama, and really competitive within hawkishness with her Republican counterparts, though not crazy, if I may say, and not irresponsible and, uh, you know, reckless, but hawkish, and much more so than Barack Obama, and I don't think that's good. I'm very sorry to say this. I think that under Hillary Clinton, we're, we're likely to get into wars we should not be in. So I have a question for you. Trump has amazed people by doing well. Mm -hmm. You're an analyst of the American experience. How come? In other words... Oh, how would I know? You know, everybody was surprised, but I'm not an analyst of domestic politics. I usually... I guess wrongly very much about what the public will go for or what they'll accept. Interesting. Interesting. <laughs> what they'll tolerate. It always goes well beyond what I So, expected. So when Trump talks about putting up a wall, forbidding Muslims to come into this right, country, right. doing all of those things, do you think he means it? Well, remember, Trump says that he had the profound insight that it was all right to be shallow. And uh, that shallowness wins, sort of. I don't know if you saw that yeah. that quote. It's not exact, but it's somewhere in the ballpark. And there's a lot to that. In other words, he obviously hasn't thought much about these problems, and he doesn't know much about them, and he knows that. And he's not even making much of a secret of it. I suppose, I presume people expect or hope who support him that he'll get good advice. And that's possibly true. You know, who, who knows who he'll turn to. Some of the other Republicans were turning to advisors who were extremely uh, ominous as far as I was concerned, the same people who got us into Iraq. And they have learned nothing, or at least they haven't learned that that was an error. And Trump has, by the way. That's Matter of fact, right. The reason the Republicans are down on him, the Republican establishment, tend to be not for his misogyny or his racism uh, or his uh, foolishness in general, but for the very things that I would say are most promising about him, that he did say that Iraq was an error and that nuclear war is an important problem and that NATO is obsolete. What could be more obvious than that? But what politician would dare to run for office saying such a thing? Well, in other words, he, he allows himself to say things that are true from time to time, that others that others aren't afraid. He's, he's bold enough to do that. So it's a little hard to predict exactly what he'll do, but it's not a promising prospect. And as I said, on domestic matters, he does, I think, seem fairly clear. And, well, again, <laughs> it's the things that Republicans don't like him for is that he's for Social Security and the health care, you know, and other things. They claim he's not a real Republican. Well, that's a compliment in my book, you know, exactly. I can see. What, but look at what they're against him for. It's the best things he says. Well, so what it comes down to is I'm not a domestic analyst, but I have become aware at 85 that some romantic illusions about the American electorate have, have dropped off here. And I am aware that this is a country that almost elected George W. Bush twice. Let me ask you, Daniel Ellsberg, about the press in the United States, the press. Yeah. Are they worse? Are they better? You handed your papers over to the New York Times and the Washington Post and all the others, and somebody had some gut. Well, interesting. Okay, yes. let's, 
here's something that occurs to me. One of my fellow residents here was Ewald Scharfenberg from Venezuela, who is part of this consortium that just put out the Panama Papers. Right. So the alliteration interested people, Pentagon Papers, Panama Papers. But there's more than the alliteration between them. These were vast, for their day, vast leaks. Now he's put out, I don't know, what, 11 million pages or something like that, which I couldn't have done with a Xerox machine and digitally. And they did them with a consortium of press. You know, one paper couldn't really get on top of all that material. And they've been sharing it, which is unusual for them. And they kept an embargo uh, until they all got together. Now, interestingly, and this again addresses your question, the New York Times was not in that consortium. In fact, the main stream paper that we know is The Guardian, which does appear here digitally and all over the world. Now, why not the New York Times? Well, they had, first of all, they thought the Times would not obey the embargo. There's an arrogance to the New York Times. They, they, we make our own rules here, you know, and so on. And second, they had not behaved very well uh, on an earlier occasion, which was also noticed by Ed Snowden. They had held on to the very information that he was putting out years earlier. They didn't have documents on the National Security Agency, the NSA, illegal criminal warrantless surveillance. And they had that. In fact, it was the same reporter, James Risen, who had that in time for the 2004 election. Uh, the, the story was ready to go, it so happened, uh, thanks to a whistleblower, a, a lot of whistleblowers. They said they had about 18 eventually, in October of 2004. And the White House called them in and said, uh, there would be blood on your hands, this would be bad. That's what they said about me and about everybody, about Manning. Uh, they said that about Manning, that he would have blood on his hands for putting out informants. They were not able, they have not come out with one instance of harm in his trial when they would have given anything to be able to tell the judge, look, this person was harmed by this reckless behavior. They couldn't find one. Well, they said the same thing about Snowden. And his revelation bill earlier, uh, with the news of this, they said, you'll have blood on your hands. We will blame you for the next terrorist attack. Everybody buckles on that threat. Uh, no congressperson is willing to be confronting that in an election. They voted wrong, and that's what led to this last set of deaths uh, somewhere. And likewise, newspaper. So Bill Keller uh, backed off, and the story was ready to die. They would never have brought it out, except a year later, Risen was now ready to put his book out. And weeks before they got scooped by their own reporter, they finally put the story out and got a Pulitzer Prize for it. Well, yeah. as I've thought, Bill Keller deserved that Pulitzer Prize, and he should also have been fired or you know, impeached by the journalistic community for hanging on to it for a year. But the, uh, and by the way, it would have come out in October, totally showing that not only the current president, George W. Bush, was guilty of massive criminality, Domestic crimes here, very clear, for uh, conceal for having this program, and that would have come out before the election. Now, if you may recall, that was the election where he actually did win the popular vote, but not in Ohio, as far as people can tell. <laughs> you know, and it was the Ohio electoral vote that brought him in, and it was that close. In other words, the knowledge that he, when he faced a television audience and said, "We do not wiretap without a warrant." You know, and that's the Fourth Amendment, and that's us. Well, that was a lie, as when Nixon said, I am not a crook. Uh, it, was a, it was a lie. They, they were both crooks. And um, uh, that revelation, I think, could very easily have swung 500,000 votes, which was the popular vote margin, could very easily have swung Ohio. So the New York Times, buckling in to the threats from the White House, gave us another four years of George W. Bush. And that's a fairly serious journalistic malfeasance, I would say. Uh, it was not their job to protect the president from that, in, from that result. So anyway, they did put it out. Other people, then, like Snowden, looked at that performance, and I take it the Panama Papers people, and said, to hell with it. We don't want, uh, we don't want the Times going to the White House and saying uh, whether they can print this or not. So the, the Times didn't get it, as a result of which, by the way, you have a story that is the front page news in almost every paper in the world on these Panama Papers, all over the world, international thing, front page. That day, having heard about it, we look at the New York Times front page. It's not there. 
page two, three, four. On page seven, there's a small story. Front page, anyway. It wasn't their story. And they were sore, probably. So that's what the readers of the New York Times learned. You mentioned something, uh, Daniel Ellsberg, that is fascinating. You know, we've gone through this technological revolution, obviously. Yes. And you mentioned before that The Guardian is online. Yeah. And I look at it online all the time. Yeah, I do. That makes a hell of a difference from the old days when you probably would have had to take a boat to Britain to get it. That's right. And notice again, though, that it had to be, <laughs> at least it was chosen to be a British, British who were putting that out. By the way, you know, just to show how this stuff works, when, uh, when Julian Assange, who's spent now years inside one room, I visited him there too in the uh, Ecuadorian con- embassy in uh, London. And so he's stuck in this room because uh, if he went to uh, Sweden for questioning, on, on the sex, sex charges, case, yeah, yeah. which he has not been charged with. He's never faced any charge, but they want him for questioning. And for some reason, the prosecutor hasn't found it convenient to come to London to interrogate him in this. Although prosecutors have done this in other countries all the time. They're, Is they're he a hero? It. Is what? Assange a hero? To me, yes. And Sentiment. I know it's a controversial figure, but he's a hero to me, as is uh, Chelsea Manning and Ed Snowden. They I identify with as uh, sources, you know, as whistleblowers. Snowden is, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Assange is not himself a whistleblower. He is a publisher. Bill Keller wouldn't recognize that. He said he's not a journalist, as I understand it, because he was trying to distance himself you from, keep, from Assange. You, Daniel Ellsberg, but I'd you say keep, he is a journalist. You keep um, referring to Bill Keller. I, I just know that our audience is not all older, and they don't know who Bill Keller oh, is, sorry, is he, with the editor, editor of the New York Times. Executive at the time. editor of the New York Times, yeah. yeah, he was. And as I say, he had some good stories, and he, uh, he did publish these finally under pressure, but his holding off on a year was, was terrible. Right, right. For a year. So, so where do we go on the question of secrets? In other words, um, you've told us some terrible stories about some of yeah. the things that have happened. Yeah. But, but obviously, yeah. you're here because you, and we have another five minutes together, because you have a sense of what ought to be done and whether or not any of it can be done. We have a United States Congress, both houses right now are yeah. in Republican hands. What do you want to see us do? We're talking about the whistleblowing case, yes. the secrecy in general. Yes. Well, first of all, let me make clear. I'm very clear. I was in the government, as I say, uh, for a dozen years, one way or another. There, ha- there are secrets. There are legitimate secrets. Everybody knows that, and I certainly know that, and I worked in that system for a long time. And I know what needs to be secret, and I also know how much not only does not need to be secret, but needs to be known. Okay, very quickly, though, Daniel, uh, yeah. what, is the, what, is, what needs to be secret? Oh, well, everybody mentions the Normandy landing, for example, the police sure. time of the Normandy landing. Very obvious. What people don't think about, by the way, is how much need for that, which took place in June of 1944, how much need for that was information about that, probably a billion pages, in June of 1945, or, for that matter, September of 1944. You can be sure that it all was secret and remained secret for the next 10, 20, 30 years. That was not necessary. Most of the trillion mm. pages or so of secrets have not needed to be secret since months or a few years after they were written. And uh, the amount of actually an expert on this subject who actually wrote most of the regulations for Pentagon says that at most 5 percent of the material that is classified deserves to be classified at the time it is classified. And he says a few years later, a tenth of that, half of 1%. That means an entirely different system. The uh, most material is kept long, for long periods, uh, jealously kept because it reveals wrongdoing, mistakes, wrong predictions, errors, or crimes. And that deserves to be out and is carefully guarded. The Espionage Act should not be used for whistleblowing. Uh, There should be an act of Congress which assures that anybody facing whistleblowing charges can mount in what they call an accountability, a public accountability defense, accountability of their their bosses, basically, that makes it possible to reveal crimes without being charged with a crime yourself. That should be legislated. 
not likely by a Republican Congress, or I have to say uh, it hasn't ever gotten through through a Democratic Congress either. And anybody charged with whistleblowing should be able to argue what their motives, whether there was a defense or not, in front of a jury. It can't be done now. And so, we, sh- in other words, we need more Snowdens and more Mannings, not less, actually, and we're not likely to get them under the current state of prosecution. Well, and, you, and I go back to your first statement. Can you have a democracy without more information than we've been getting? No. And I would say our democracy in foreign affairs and in uh, military affairs is very defective, very questionably a republic in a, in a real sense. What we're doing in this, in this election we're about to have, we're having, is electing a, a monarch, electing an emperor of an empire. And uh, that wasn't the idea of the original founders, and uh, they had a better idea. We've been in conversation with my hero, Daniel Ellsberg, activist, lecturer, author, and former military analyst and a participant at the Cary Institute, and a person who changed a lot of what goes on in America by being unafraid for his own personal safety and doing what had to be done. Daniel Ellsberg, what a pleasure. Thanks so much for joining us today. (laughs) Thank you for those words. Thank you. been listening to Dr. Alan Shartok, President and CEO of WAMC Northeast Public Radio and Professor Emeritus at the University at Albany. For more information on the In Conversation with Alan series or to order additional copies of this or any interview in the series, call 1-800-323-9262 or visit us on the web at wamc.org.